I'm Jessica Denson, host of Lights On with Jessica Denson here on the Midas Touch Network, and I'm so honored to be joined by Tennessee Representative Gloria Johnson. Representative Johnson, welcome to this special episode of Lights On. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm enjoyed being here. Looking forward to it. <laughs> well, we as a we as a nation got to know what a rock star and badass woman, which we love to have badass women here on Lights On, that you are. A, month or so back when you and your fellow colleagues, Representative Jones and Representative Pearson, were threatened with expulsion. They, of course, were expelled from the Tennessee legislature. You survived that by one vote, but you have been just the most amazing fighter on behalf of your constituents in Tennessee. And we are hearing news, and this is what I'm so excited to talk to you about, that you may take on Senator Marsha Blackburn in the upcoming uh, U.S. Senate race. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, you know, I've been actually thinking about it for about six months and uh, just wondering what that would look like and everything, uh, trying to consider, you know, what the what the bath, best path forward is, how I can help my state the best. And um, and so then, of course, the recent events over the last month and a half. So um, it's, it's kind of I, I saw Nancy Pelosi spoke and she said, sometimes there's a moment and you have to be ready. So that made me think and, uh, you know, think more seriously about it. So I haven't uh, come to that 100 percent yet, but I am still um, trying to make that decision and see what the best thing for our state is. That's what I'm I'm taking into consideration. We are fighting an erosion of democracy in Tennessee. And so uh, I just want to make sure that we are motivating our democratic base, making sure as many people go out to vote. And I'm just going to figure out and I'm talking to folks to find out where they think I, I might best serve. Uh, because I was asked by a whole lot of people over the whole last year to do this. And so um, I'm just getting more serious and serious as I consider the possibilities for, you know, 2024. I definitely want to talk to you more about that attack on democracy in Tennessee. I think that it's kind of a microcosm of a lot of the southern states and what you showed with all of the people that came out in support of just this common sense gun reform that that Republicans and so-called conservatives have been so reluctant to pass to actually save lives was such a such a beautiful display of what the will of the people really is. But just going back to Marsha Blackburn, I mean, she is such a she almost seems to revel in her cruelty. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I really am rubbed the wrong way by some of the things she says as a Christian, because she, she's one of those ones that go out, goes out and parades her faith and, you know, breaks the golden rule and, um, do not bear false witness against your neighbor every day. Can you tell me just from your perspective, what are some of the, um, you know, policies and just standpoints from, of Marsha Blackburn that would motivate you to run against her in Tennessee? She is so extreme. She is way outside what the average Republican and Democrat and independent in Tennessee want. I mean, she is, um, she has deep in the pockets of the pharmaceutical lobby of the NRA, you know, these things. And Tennessee, what people don't understand about Tennessee, um, we do tip as a state typically tend to vote red or vote Republican. But the reality is we've seen um, poll after poll in Tennessee that says more than 70 percent of Tennesseans want Medicaid expansion. We haven't even expanded Medicaid in our state. More than 60 percent of Tennesseans on all sides of the aisle want to invest in public schools, not charters and vouchers. And then paid family leave is supported overwhelmingly by 84% of Tennesseans. And that's red and blue counties. Um, abortion, at least in some form or fashion, is overwhelmingly supported by 80% of Tennesseans in every county. And they are, we have a full, complete abortion ban with no exception for rape and, and incest only a sliver of an exception for life of the mother, only in the instance of an ectopic pregnancy or a, a non-living fetus. That's it. 
And there are so and this many was other- one of those trigger laws that took effect once Roe was overturned, wasn't it? Absolutely. And so it was a huge surprise for the people. And even when they passed that bill, that trigger ban back in 2019, the sponsor of that bill lied on the House floor because I asked the sponsor, I said, is there an exception for rape, incest, and the life of the mother? And at first she said, no, which was the truth. Then after I spoke a little bit longer, she came back and said, oh, wait, there's an exception for life of the mother, which is a lie, complete and total lie. It is probably still on the website uh, summarized as having an exception for life of the mother, but there was never one. They put in a sliver this last legislative session, but we live in a state where 10 year old girls are forced to carry a pregnancy. And there are potential felony charges aren't there for people who are involved in trying to help someone who is in need of an abortion get an abortion? Physicians uh, stand up against 15 years. So they've set up the situation that the more in danger a woman is of her life and the life of the fetus, the safer the physician is. You know, if they wait till that very last second, maybe they won't be convicted of a felony. But the reality is under the original law, um, they would, they could be, they could be charged and lose their license, have to hire an attorney and have to defend them themselves in court, even for an ectopic pregnancy. Just the most extreme. And Tennesseans do not believe in that. But they are not legislating for Tennessee families. They are legislating for the special interests and the NRA, the Tennessee Firearms Association, and the Right to Life, Tennessee Right to Life organization. Yeah, and Tennessee, like you were saying, is one of those states that's just under, democracy is under attack in your state. And it just, I I recall just recently the gerrymandering of Nashville. They eliminated that Democratic seat for the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, Just a complete disregard of the will of the people of Nashville, which is a very blue city. Um, What do you think needs to be done? And, and, you know, I think turning, turning, Tennessee into a blue represented state in the, in the U.S. Senate would be a huge step in that direction. Of course, we saw it happen in Georgia with the election of Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. But what do you think can be done to combat these authoritarian tendencies um, that was reflected in, in that expulsion vote, this, this attempt to just silence dissent, which happens to be the will of the majority of the people of the state? What, what can we do to, to flip the script? Absolutely. I think that what we've got to do is take advantage of this movement. And what we see are the young people stepping up and standing up and saying, we will not go back. We will not go back to our classrooms where we do active shooter drills and fear for our lives while we're trying to to learn. You know, it's just remarkable that a lot of the legislation, just hideous legislation they passed this year that actually hurts children, they said under the guise of we're protecting children, protect the children from the guns. And they act as if, you know, everybody's going to take away their guns. That's absolutely not what's not going to happen. We want things like red flag laws and safe storage laws, universal background checks with no loopholes. These are things that overwhelmingly 80, 70 to 80% of Tennesseans want to see happen, but they're not doing the will of even their own party right now. They're doing the will of the special interests. And in, in Tennessee, what happens is Republicans are really only concerned about their primaries. They're not concerned about their Democratic opponent. They think they've got that covered. But what they're concerned about are their Democrat, are their Republican primaries. And so they go as far as they can to extreme right to motivate that base. And so they can win their Republican primary. That's what my colleagues in the House do. That's what Senator Blackburn does. You know, it's just 
ignoring the will of the majority of Tennessee families of all parties and doing the bed the the bidding of the special interests. And you know, in the Tennessee House, what we've seen is they cut our mics. They limit debate debate to five minutes. Uh, they won't call on us much of the time. They won't accept our amendments. You know, when I was there first in 2013 and 14, we had a speaker, Republican speaker, uh, Speaker Harwell, Beth Harwell. And um, I can tell you that I don't recall her cutting mics. I don't recall ever not being called on when I had my hand up. And, and certainly they did not limit debate like they do now. So um, what we see, it it's, shows absolute power corrupts absolutely. When you have a supermajority, you don't even need the other party in the room. They don't even like to have a discussion. You know, we're discussing a bill. Last year, we were discussing the biggest piece of legislation we've passed in years, and it was a new funding formula for education. Precious little debate. It's embarrassing and shameful that Tennesseans did not understand that bill. And it wasn't even fully baked. It was like we were flying the plane in midair and they voted while the plane was still in midair. And they don't care because they have the votes and their folks just follow along and do what they're told. And then they go, oh, wait, that's a mistake. We shouldn't have done that. Well, <laughs> we told you. It seems like they really take their power for granted in Tennessee with these supermajorities, and they take the disengagement of voters for granted. And I think that's why, like you said, this momentum is such a promising shift because when people are watching um, and when they get to see what they are really engaged in, it is ugly and nobody wants this. Nobody wants people like this running um, their state legislatures, their US House, Congress presidency, nothing. And I, I want to I want to just point out, because like I said, when we introduced you, I, I really think you've been a badass woman fighting in Tennessee for so long. We just got to know you on a national level level recently. I, I think that if I read this correctly, you were the only vote to abstain from voting for the current House Speaker uh, Sexton. And he retaliated against you by um, shoving you into a windowless conference room and putting your your aide in a, in a closet. Am I right about that? <laughs> Yeah, and then my uh, my office was not. It was about yeah. the size of a clo a small closet, actually, and um, and lit for a year. And but the interesting thing, it's like not only do they do childish retaliatory things like that, but then right across across the hall from me was the empty office, the extra member office that I didn't get sat empty across the hall from me yeah. for a year. And, you know, this was COVID. There weren't there weren't even six feet to social distance in my office if I had someone come in and I couldn't have more than one person in my office. It was uh, it was truly something. But I could not vote for someone who has kept our state for 10 years from having access to affordable health care and someone who tried to keep the bust of Nathan Bedford Forrest, a slave trader, a murderer and the first KKK of the Grand Wizard. That bust sat outside the doors of our, our the house floors, and uh, we had to walk past it to go onto the house floor. Our black members had to walk past that statue of a murderous slave trader as we went onto the house floor. What message is that sending? It's a very clear message. And of course, um, when they tried to expel you, and they did expel representatives Justin and Pearson, there were such, such far, uh, much worse um, violations of decorum, if you would say. I mean, I've heard that there was somebody urinated on someone else's seat. You had people seated in the house who had um, criminal indictments pending, who were convicted on domestic violence. I mean, just the, sta the standard was not even close. Um, and, and we've heard, I think, since since those expulsions, and of course they, their seats were reinstated and they're running again for that special, uh, to, to regain permanently their seats through special election. But um, we heard after that, that it's possible that rep uh, the, House, the House Speaker Sexton does not even live in his district. Can you give us any update on anything that's going on with that? He doesn't live in the district. His kids are enrolled in school here in Nashville. He has a home in Nashville. Um, I 
you know, people have been saying to me for a year that they haven't seen him in Crossville, the town where he's supposed to live. And so, um, you know, a lot of people have known about it, but nobody's uh, really cared about it until some national folks like Jud Judd Lagoon looked into it. And, the, you know, the thing about it is, I feel like when you talk about that day, I feel like, like, it just window just light was shown on that house floor and the whole nation even the world saw what was happening in the tennessee legislature which we had tried to talk about but until you actually see it firsthand it's just like oh my goodness you know how can people be doing this and getting away with it it was just maybe a month before i was sitting in criminal justice committee one of my colleagues, they had a bill to bring back the um, electric chair and firing squads for the death penalty. And one of my colleagues, after I spoke against the bill, one of my colleagues said, well, I like this bill and I think I'm gonna sign on. And I think we should bring back hanging by a tree. Well, hanging by a tree is lynching. He didn't say gallows. He said hanging by a tree. It's there, it's there all the time. And I will not let those comments go by without speaking up. We have to tell the truth. It may be a hard truth and people may not like it, but we have got to tell the truth because this hate and bigotry, I feel like it's growing and it's part of silencing an opinion of somebody who respects the human dignity of every person in this state. We should expect the dignity of every human being in this country. That's not what we're seeing in the Tennessee legislature. And it scares me to death. Well, I, I hope that fear is a, a motivating factor. I know you have a lot of fans out there in Tennessee and across this country who would absolutely love to see you bring that sunlight um, to to the U.S. Senate. And a lot of these things from, from local to state to federal, um, it's going to take more Democrats who are doing, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as someone who came from the other side of the aisle and seeing that the Democrats are the ones who are engaged in good faith efforts to really protect our freedom. Um, you, you've been bringing to light what it takes in that fight, what's at stake, and these forces that we're fighting against. Um, thank you so much for joining us on this special ed edition of Lights On. Where can, where can our viewers follow you and stay up to date on, on any announcements you may make uh, in this yeah. potential bid to challenge Marsha? Well, they can follow me on Facebook, State Representative Gloria Johnson. On Twitter, vote Gloria J. Instagram, I'm Rep Gloria Johnson, I believe. And then, of course, the Tennessee General Assembly website has my the page for my office and my contacts at my office as well. And so, it's been great to have so many people reaching out and saying, you know, thank you for shining a light on these things. And um, it's really been wonderful to raise the voices of these young people and these parents. You know, my colleagues across the aisle were so offensive to these families from Covenant who were suffering after that shooting. They called them a woke mob. They called them insurrectionists. Just, that's a horrible way to talk about families who were suffering the death of either children or school staff. It's just, it's no way to treat people. We have to be better. I know Tennessee is better than this, and we have got to do better. Well, as someone who has spent a lot of time in Tennessee and absolutely loves the state from Knoxville to Nashville to, to Memphis and, and uh, Gatlinsburg, all, all across the state, it's a beautiful state. I know the people do deserve better than what is going on in that legislature right now. Representative Gloria Johnson, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. <laughs>